Greetings. It's great to be with you again. We want to greet all our friends in CMM around the world and family and all our school students too with the CMM College of Theology. And we're very blessed today to have a special guest with us. This is uh, Nicholas Papanicolaou. Many of you have heard of him, but he's a great historian, a great friend, even more than that. And uh, we just so appreciate him taking a few minutes to be with us. So welcome, Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And Nicholas is a, 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 a mighty man of the Lord, and he's from Greece originally. He comes from uh, the royal family in Greece, and just a fount of knowledge about history in the Mediterranean and the Middle East. And so, Nicholas, we know there's constant change going on, and recent election, we're, we're thankful that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu was uh, re-elected again. Don't know if he got the majority or not to for, form a coalition, but we pray for the Mediterranean nations. Uh, we've had many prophetic words about what the Lord is doing, and desires to do there, but give us an update on current status of what's happening in the Mediterranean region and what can we expect in the near future? Yeah, we, 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 we should focus on the Eastern Mediterranean and uh, speaking about Bibi, uh, according to their constitution, you need 61 uh, seats in the Knesset in order to be able to form a government. And I think it's still unclear if you got 60 or 61. Uh -huh. so, very close. Though. So yeah, very close and they're counting. So if he got 61, he can form a government. If he got 60, he cannot. So he will continue to be a caretaker prime minister and they'll have to have elections again. And they've had three elections in the last year. Now, in the Eastern Med, um, everybody's focused on the war in Syria and Russia coming in, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that there are really three pivotal countries that I want to talk about. And those are Israel, Egypt, and Greece. Now. Uh, Egypt had its, its uh, uh, bout with, uh, uh, when they elected Morsi, Mohammed Morsi from the Muslim Brotherhood. It had its bout with uh, flirting with uh, is Islamization and it, it has been slowly getting Islamized. And then of course, thank God, the army under General al-Sisi uh, took over. They put Morsi in jail. They've respected him. They, in fact, I think he passed away about a year ago, but they, they treated him with respect, but he was taken out of the political arena. And the Egyptian leadership went back to trying to serve the country and not some religious system, but to serve their country. And al-Sisi also had the courage um, uh, two years ago on New Year's Day to go to Al-Ashar University, which is the foremost university of theology for Islam. Uh, and uh, he had about three, four hundred imams and mullahs there, and he lectured them sternly. And he said, the world does not owe you anything to be afraid of you all the time and your terrorism, etc. And he said, you need to reform and you need to mend your ways. And I remember the camera did a sweep uh, of his audience, of all these imams, and of course they were sitting there grim-faced, you know, because they don't, do not like to be lectured like that. But al-Sisi is, is a ray of light there. The second country, of course, that is of great interest is Israel, and for obvious reasons. So Israel is, of course, a pivotal uh, country. Uh, I personally am always guided by what the Lord says to Abraham in Genesis, when he blesses him and he says, you will be a patriarch, your uh, offspring will be countless, as countless as the seeds of sand on, 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 on the beach. And then he says, and I will bless him who blesses you, and I will curse him who curses you. So I'm guided by that. And Israel, from that point of view, is a pivotal country. Uh, and uh, so we always wish it well. As you know, George, you and I have known each other and been close friends for, what, 15 years now? Long time, yes, yeah. 15. Right. So Israel, and of course, political stability in Israel is also uh, very important, and that's why these elections are so key. And the third country is, of course, Greece, which is the, the country of my, of my birth. Uh, I always say when I'm asked, I, I, I say I'm Greek by birth and I am American by choice. That was my choice, to be American. Now, the story of Egypt and Israel, uh, or pardon me, of Israel and Greece is very uh, uh, telling and interesting because up until about eight years ago, uh, the Israelis, whatever government was, was uh, in, in authority, had an attitude that they could cooperate and make a strategic ally out of Turkey. So they were flirting with Turkey all the time. And of course, 
if you thought about it really logically, especially Turkey under Erdogan, who is, is an Islamist, it made no sense because every Islamist wants to see basically Israel wiped off the face of the earth. And the reason they did that is because they, they were figuring, okay, you know, they've got a big army and, uh, you know, they're practically on our border and uh, so we should make nice with them. And all of that went out the window when uh, those famous uh, ship relief expeditions took place where they, the uh, Turks, the Turkish government officially had loaded up these ships, uh, two ships with supplies and was, was trying to bring them into Gaza. And the Israelis interdicted that. And if you remember, there was even some bloodshed. Yeah. And that was a big wake-up call for Israel that you've been pursuing the wrong strategy here with this, with this country, Turkey. Greece, for its part, also had a pro-Arab, let's say, foreign policy uh, that was handed down from the 1940s and 50s and 60s. Why? Because there were substantial Greek populations, minority populations in, in all those Muslim countries that border the Eastern Mediterranean, from Egypt to uh, Syria to Lebanon, etc. And the Greek government, whichever government it was of whatever party, was trying to protect them. Both governments, Israel and Greece, were wrong because Turkey proved its mettle with this incident that I mentioned in Israel. And all those Arab countries, including Egypt, proved their mettle because basically they decimated the Greek um, uh, uh, minority colonies that existed in those countries. Greeks were very adept at commerce in each one of those countries. All their property was expropriated and they were sent back to Greece with you know, just a suitcase that, that, that they could carry. Wow. So at a certain point about eight, ten years ago, the two shining and true democracies in the Eastern Mediterranean, Israel and Greece, took a look at each other and said in effect, what the heck have we been doing for so long? supporting illusions, we are natural allies. And so they struck up an alliance which uh, is a military alliance uh, in the sense that uh, the Greek um, uh, armed forces, especially the Air Force, but also the Navy, do joint exercises with uh, the IDF. And uh, uh, this is a, a new strategy that Greece developed, which uh, thankfully has been followed both by the government of the center-right and also by the socialists. Wonderful. So, so they stuck to it. And uh, the result is that there is serious military cooperation between the IDF and the Greek armed, armed forces. So that's a very interesting factor. And it's also, uh, it fits in well with the fact that when, as you look at the map of the Eastern Mediterranean, and you've got Israel down here, then you've got Cyprus, then you've got the Greek islands here, Rhodes and so forth and so on, and, and Greece over here. In this whole area of the sea between Israel and Cyprus, and in also Greek national waters that go south of, of uh, Cyprus and uh, uh, Rhodes, etc., mm -hmm. there is apparently very, there are very substantial uh, um, uh, natural gas and oil deposits. And so the Turks, of course, are looking at all of this, Mr. Erdogan, with great avarice, you know, with a very greedy eye. And uh, seeing this new military cooperation uh, begin between Israel and Greece, uh, he started trying to develop his own. And so he made overtures to Egypt, but they were not too successful, but then made overtures to Libya, to the new Libya, the destroyed Libya that Hillary Clinton left in her wake, right? right? The wreck, which is now uh, a birthplace also for terrorism and right. so forth. And the Libyans responded and they made a joint declaration and listen to this. They said, Turkey and we, Libya, have a common border. Well, how do you have a common border? Excuse me. In between Turkey and Libya, you have Syria, you have Lebanon, and you have Egypt. So how come you have a common border? But of course, Erdogan is hearkening back to the days of the Ottoman Empire. Right. That's what he wants. So he comes out with this declaration and also another declaration where he said the, the islands in the Aegean do not belong to Greece, they, they belong to Turkey. And when it was pointed out to him by a European journalist about two years ago, uh, who said, but excuse me, there's the Treaty of um, uh, Lausanne here that was signed by the Turkish government at the time in 1923, which acknowledges that all those islands in the Aegean belong to Greece. His response was, whoever signed this on, on the side of Turkey was a traitor, 
on behalf of Turkey was a traitor and we don't recognize it. So today, when you look at the official Turkish government uh, produced maps that they have in their Ministry of Defense, etc., they show that they have a common border with, with uh, Libya. Wow. They're nuts. They're crazy. crazy. So there's a situation there which is, um, it's a boiling pot. Mm -hmm. And whether it's going to explode or not, I don't know, but, but it's, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, and Turkey wants those reserves of natural gas. And in its way stands who? Israel and, uh, and Greece. And to some degree, Egypt, which also has some share in, in, you know, in their offshore, uh, the bottom of the sea Research. kind of thing, you know, exactly. Mm -hmm. the, it's called the uh, economic, um, uh, it's the economic zone which extends beyond just the, the, you know, the three or four miles, which is your strict boundary. I think it's like 12 miles and, and so forth. So it's a dangerous situation. Now, compounding that background, is the really ruthless game that Erdogan has been playing with so-called war refugees from Syria. Turkey, over the last, uh, since the war in Syria started, has turned receiving refugees into Turkey, Ill illegal refugees, into a national industry. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? They let them come in, and everybody knows that if they wanted to stop them at their border, because they have a, a, a large army, they could do it. They could control the border. But they made purposely a choice not to control it. So over the last eight or ten years, they have accumulated about four million refugees in wow. Turkey, plus spilled over into Europe another at least a million and a half, which principally happened in, in 2015. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about a total of about five and a half million so-called refugees. The truth about the identity of those refugees is that they are not Syrian war refugees. They're not Syrian. The European Union itself, its uh, commissioner for um, uh, citizenship and migration, uh, who happens to be a Greek, his name is Mr. Avramopoulos, the European Union itself says that in 2015, when a million and a half refugees came into Europe through Greece, it acknowledges in its official stats that 70% of them were not Syrian. Only 29.9% were Syrian. Mm -hmm. the, what were the others? Somali, Iraqi, Afghani, Libyan, Tunisian, Moroccan, Nigeria. you name it, mm -hmm. you name it. This is economic migration, but it is also jihadi migration, right. and I will explain why. So, today is March 3rd. Three days ago, on February 29, Mr. Erdogan, who was demanding various concessions from the European Union that were not forthcoming, in trade had threatened that he was going to open his borders and push those four million refugees out of Turkey and into Europe. He was using that as a lever. Of course, the bureaucrats of the European Union who are nicely and safely up in Brussels and Strasbourg, etc., don't didn't really take to this threat, to this danger, and they kept saying no. But Guess who is the guy that is on the front line that is going to suffer the brunt of this? Greece, right? right. So three days ago, on February 29, Erdogan makes an announcement and he says, I'm opening my borders and these people are going to go into Europe. In the first two days, March 1st and March 2nd, about 50,000 refugees have spilled over into the Greek islands. In some cases, some of those Greek islands are only a thousand yards away from the Turkish coast. So all they have to do is get on an inflatable. And what has Erdogan done, done on top of that announcement? He puts them into life, um, uh, inflatables. Mm -hmm. They are escorted by the Turkish uh, Coast Guard up to the border of Greece. And then they slash their boat. They're all wearing uh, lifesavers life jackets, mm -hmm. and they fall into the water, at which point the Greek Navy, under European Union edicts, is obliged to pick them out of the sea and bring them in to Greece, on, onto Greek te territory, and then process them as asylum seekers. Yeah. And as in America, 
those who are rejected as asylum seekers actually are never expelled. They s disappear into the landscape of, of Greece and of Europe because Greece being a member nation, it was the 10th member nation of the 27 member nation now uh, of the European Union, is obliged to process them at a, a documentation center and there's a documentation center on each of the islands and the guy appears typically uh, some are women, but a, a sm very small number, women and, and children. Most are able-bodied men, younger men, able-bodied men. And they say, I'm a Syrian war refugee. They speak Arabic, of course. Uh, I just escaped the war in, in Syria with just the clothes on my back, and uh, I have no other documentation. And they are issued a temporary asylum seeker's ID, which is a European Union document. And with that document, they can get on a train or on a ferry and leave Greece and go into the heart of Europe. So the, the system is completely abused. And it reminds me personally of the wisdom of somebody like Trump, President Trump, who you remember up until about a year ago, there were those caravans, 15,000 person caravans marching on the American border. Right. What did he do? He would have none of it. He stopped it. Right. Right? But not so. Greece has its hands tied because of European Union humanitarian regulations. So the Turks, I repeat, the Coast Guard, their Coast Guard ship brings them, escorts those inflatables right to the border, the maritime border of Greece. They slash the boat. Now they're in the water. And Greece is obliged, the Greek naval ships are obliged to pick them out of the water and bring them into Greece. So I can give you an itemized list because I've been, I've been staying up to date. All of this is in the last three days, right. George, if you can imagine. Oh, yeah. 8,500 uh, the first day on the island of Chios, 5,900 on the other island. On the island of Lesvos, Mytilini, yeah. already, because it's not, you know, densely populated, the relationship of refugee to, to, to local uh, inhabitant mm -hmm. is one-to-one -one wow. already. The, uh, those islands are being taken over. Yeah. And the images that appear on the Greek television stations, because there are news crews there, this is not being covered in America because uh, the focus is on the election and the yeah. primaries and so forth. But the images that, that are captured on European TV show able-bodied men and I am making you a bet right now for our listeners, for our audience. These are Turkish paramilitaries. Mm. This is an invasion. Right. And they will stay in the countries in Europe that they choose to stay in. They will arm themselves. And one day, internal fighting is going to, to evolve which will be a takeover, a Muslim take, takeover of those countries. Right. Uh, you look at the faces of these people as they, as they fish them out of the... These are able-bodied young men. And I must add that in its long and sad and cruel record of treating other religions that the Turks have accumulated uh, over the last 100, 120 years mm -hmm. with the genocide of the Armenians, genocide of the Greeks, etc., the Turkish government, whatever it was, has always resorted to paramilitaries. In other words, they will take able-bodied men out of their regular army, take them out of uniform, and then let them loose to practice their barbarity on the Christian populations so that they can disclaim any responsibility, official responsibility. And they let the paramilitaries do all the dirty work. And what is invading Europe now through Greece, right now, these last three days, by the tens of thousands every day, is paramilitaries wow. that are coming in. Amazing. It is it So is as this appalling. boils over and continues to intensify, do you see much possibility of the Greek military stopping those inflatables in Turkish waters? Or would no. that be declared an act the, of war? The, the, the Greek military cannot go into Turkish waters. If they had the will and could get that monkey that is called the European Union off their back, like England did, mm -hmm. they could say, no, we're gonna, uh, we don't care if you're in the water, swim back. It's only, you know, as I say, it's a thousand yards. Right, right. Swim back. You have a lifesaver, swim back. We're not taking you. They're not doing it mm -hmm. because European Union regulations oblige them to fish them out of the water and accept them. So the only place where they are stopping this uh, wave of refugees is on the land boundary with, with Turkey, which is up in, uh, in eastern Thrace, 
by the river, uh, the river is called Evros, and there the Greek military has, has put up uh, roadblocks like Trump did, etc., and has been stopping them for the last three days and saying, no, you can't come in. But there's so many islands, they can't of stop course, that if they're course, not allowed to course. protect those islands that are... F 50 vessels of the, of the Hellenic Navy have been deployed over the last three days to guard those islands, but the Turks figured this out very, very carefully, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and they're taking clearly advantage of the humanitarian regulations that the European Union imposes on its member nations like Greece wow. by slashing the boat at sea. Mm -hmm. Because if the boat is still, is still afloat, the Greek Navy could try to, to repel it, right. like the Maltese did, mm -hmm. repel it and push it back. But once they slash it and they're in the sea, the Greek government is obliged to fish them out of the sea and then bring them to, to a mainland and, and process them. And complicating that factor is that now the socialist government in Greece, very much like the Democrats in, here in America, is saying, oh no, you know, we, we have to accept anybody that, that wants to come in here, you know, we should have open borders. It's the same thing, except that you see the difference in willpower between President Trump, mm -hmm. how he's handled it, and how in Greece right now the, the government is of the center right. right. But they apparently lack the, the political will to say, we don't care if, in the, if we're in the water. So, for example, Hungary is a member of the European Union. And in fact, one of the last uh, members, weak economically, etc. So. Uh, the argument can be made that if they wanted to object to any European Union regulation, they would be in the least powerful position to do it because they're one of the, of the last few members and they also are very needy economically, etc. And yet, their president, President Urban, for the last eight years has been saying to the European Union, I don't care what you say, I don't care what your regulations are, these refugees are not coming through my country. Right. He's taken a strong exactly. stance, exactly. strong Christian, and they've done a lot to help protect persecuted Christians. So exactly. Hungary is a bright light in that dark continent exactly. of liberal open border policies that is just an invitation right. for democratization and overthrow of their constitutions. Um, it's like this uh, uh, global trend towards um, Anarchy and chaos is what they want, and you wonder who's exactly. behind it. I mean, the European Union, but well, who's behind the European Union? Some say it's the like the, the new, new world order, the right. globalism that exactly. wants to see all these nations fall uh, in submission to a one world type government, one bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unelected, by the way. Right. right, but that's exactly and and again, there you see the contrast between the leadership of Hungary and the leadership of Greece. Because President Urban in Hungary said, I, the, the Europeans, you know, the bureaucrats said, no, you have to obey, you have to obey. And he said, I am not, I don't care what you do. I don't care if you throw us out, I don't care what you do. They're not coming through my soil. Right. And the Greek government now, maybe my hope is that they're slowly gearing up to this because I'm telling you, the country is getting over, uh, getting taken over. Mm -hmm. Those islands which are in the Eastern Mediterranean, islands like Lesbos, um, Chios, uh, Samos, even Ro Rhodes right. is not, has not been particularly invaded these last two or three days. And you know it intimately right. because we go there every year and we meet and we have a great time. Yes, uh, we have many good friends there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so there has not been over the last three days a big wave of immigration into Rhodes just because the distance is larger. Right. Now, George, you've been there. You know that when you look out from our hotel, you can see the Turkish coast. Just across the water. Just across the water. And in fact, it's so close that sometimes, I don't know if you've noticed on your, on your cellular, the signal that it receives sometimes is from a Greek phone company and sometimes it's yes, for a Turkish I and you've got to be on the lookout that. constantly because if it switches you to the Turkish company and you make a call, yes. they charge you three times what, what it's... And I think it was about four years ago right. when we were on roads and in the newspaper, Erdogan, who was trying to resurrect the Ottoman Empire, right. he had the islands... Uh, in the Mediterranean that were colored red right. that he believes are property of Turkey and right. Rhodes was painted red. Exactly. That all he's the, all saying the, he owns that. Yes, yes, yes. And th that's why, that's where he came up with the, the, this uh, uh, idea that Libya and Turkey share a common border. Sure. Really? So where's Lebanon? Where's Syria? Where's Egypt? They don't count for nothing. Mm -hmm. Tunisia is in between also. Yeah. They count for nothing. Erdogan's a prime example of that bully he's, spirit. He's, 
of just trying to yeah. intimidate those that disagree right. with him. And he just runs roughshod over the European Union, including Greece, and uh, um, just intimidating them uh, and catches them off guard like he's doing with slashing these inflatables. Right, right. So I've sent actually yesterday a message to um, uh, um, the, the, the most recent, let's say, Prime Minister of Greece, whom I, I know quite well, and I said, you need to stop this, and maybe you should be talking with President uh, Orban of Hungary and bring Hungarian army detachments down to our border also, because then you turn it into a more inter-European Union right. problem. And I also said, you should be chartering ferry boats, rounding up whoever is not a, um, uh, a legal uh, asylum seeker in Greece, Give them three months, and if they're rejected, and of course, if you're Somali or Iraqi, you're going to be rejected because you're not a bona fide war refugee. You're an economic refugee or you are a jihadi refugee, but you're not a Syrian war refugee. Right. And therefore, you have no business getting asylum. Mm -hmm. So, and I said, you should hire ferry boats and round these people, put them all in, and then bring them to the coast of Syria. Because if you bring them to the coast of Turkey, there'll be war mm -hmm. with the Turks. But bring them to the coast of Syria, and disembark them. Put your lifeboats down, put them on, and sail away. Right. Um, and so we'll see. But this is, you know, I'm reminded when I read the Koran, the, the, the uh, conquest by Islam is, is not only of a military nature. It is of any nature. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and, and following the example of Muhammad, when he was at war with the other, other Arab tribes, you remember he had to escape Mecca and go to Medina, uh, because they, they were going to kill him in Mecca. And then he waged war against the tribes from Mecca and other tribes. And what he would do typically is he would send paramilitaries in and they would form a local mosque. And the mosque in Islam was not a religious house only. It was also an arms depository. It was a propaganda center. And the 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 uh, teaching in Islam is that whatever Muhammad did, since he led the perfect life, you should emulate, and if you emulate it, you too will be blessed as he was. Mm. So the mosque in Islam is not just a house of worship. It is an arms depository, it's a propaganda depository, and it's a hiding place, right. a place of refuge for the fighters, for the jihadis. Right. We need to wake up in this country too. Uh, even near where we are today, there are reported camps and training grounds. Right um, here in your county. In mosque, so-called mosque, yeah. and ten, within 10 miles of here. Yeah. Yeah. Right here in your county two. where we are, there's a paramilitary. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, it is, what is incredible is that people are, have not woken up to these realities mm -hmm. uh, yet. Yes. So uh, that's, that's a quick sort of analysis, if you like, of what is happening in the Eastern Mediterranean. I, I do want to close with one comment. Mm -hmm. In all of Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, there is only one place where the Lord clearly identifies where Satan has his home on earth. Right, where's that? Revelation, the letter to the church of Pergamum. Mm -hmm. where and where's Pergamum? In Pergamum modern? is right by Troy. It says, you look at Asia Minor, it's in the northwestern part of Asia Minor. Mm -hmm. And the Lord says to, to, to John, the, the, uh, the evangelist, who is receiving his dictation, he says, take these seven le letters to the seven churches, right? And when it comes to Pergamum, what does the Lord say? Directing himself, addressing himself to the people in Pergamum, he says, I know where, where you are and the difficulties that you have. I'm paraphrasing a little bit mm -hmm. uh, in spreading the word because you are where Satan has his home on earth. In one short paragraph of five lines, twice the Lord says where Satan has his home on earth. Mm -hmm. So he identifies it. Where's Pergamum? Turkey. Right. Expect a lot of bad stuff to come out of there. Really? You know, I was uh, on a, a Zoom call earlier with a friend who was born in Egypt and comes out of the Coptic church background. And we were talking, and he was just in Greece right. at a refugee center um, and got home just a few days ago from there. And he shared a lot of fascinating information, but their ministry is called the uh, Friends of the Sons of Ishmael. And so they're called to minister the love of Jesus mm. to 
of the sons of Ishmael, which we know are the, uh, of the Arab background, many are, are Muslims. And he reported how many people that he's met, and we've heard it from our friend uh, Farzad and others that work in the, in the Middle East there that come from Arab backgrounds, of so many of them having dreams and visions of encountering the man in white who is Jesus, and uh, gave some powerful testimonies of this one man that he met who was from Turkey, who had an encounter with Jesus, and he's now in Greece. I think he got there a couple of weeks ago, just before this armada is mm -hmm. coming over the, since February 29th from Turkey. But uh, he was a changed man, and we have taken teams into Germany where we've ministered to um, many of these refugees that came up through um, uh, as refugees, so-called from North Africa, West Africa, um, uh, Iran, Iraq, Syria, um, some from Pakistan, and are now in, were in Germany at the time. And some of them, many of them were coming to the Lord, but many of them were still resistant, and many of them wanted to return to their homeland of origin. Um, but still, it's, when you open the floodgates and have open borders, it's just inviting tyranny and takeover exactly. by um, these uh, Ottoman Empire uh, hopefuls that want to take over Europe and turn it into a Muslim continent. Yeah. And the numbers are against those of European origin and ancestry because of the low birth rates right. of, of the Europeans. Right. Uh, you know, the reports are that by, what, 2050, I wouldn't be surprised if it's by 2040 at this point that the majority in Europe will be of, of a Muslim um, Arabic background. Yeah. Um, and I want to get back to, to Egypt with our friend uh, Hani. He was talking about uh, Isaiah 19. What do you, how do you see that applying to Egypt and, and the end times and Israel? Um, and well, Isaiah you know, a, a lot depends when you read that in Ezekiel 38, etc. depends on whether the historians who are providing the commentary have gotten the names that applied at that time for those countries, Kush, for uh -huh. example, right. whether they've gotten them right to what the modern day equivalent country is, what country it means. Mm -hmm. So when they say Kush in the Old Testament, who is it today? Who is that? Is it Southern Russia? Who, who is it? So a lot depends on how you interpret that. But there is one thing that is clear, and that is that there is a, some, you know, a major conflagration coming there and, you know, um, uh, uh, and, and, and you can see it because there are so many, you know, clashing, uh, comp competing forces. Uh, one more thing that I wanted to add is that Erdogan, as you very well know, uh, ordered the Turkish army to invade into Syria about four or five months ago. And in the process, they destroyed the operations of some of our friends, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the ministries that were feeding war refugees and trying to evangelize right. uh, to them, etc. They destroyed that. They also went, the Turkish army, door to door in villages and towns looking for Christians looking and for Christians. extracting them from their homes and, and shooting them or, or ca carrying them away. So it, this is a... Um, it's, it's a new genocide, Turkish genocide, that is being practiced against the Christians in the area. And um, it, it, as I say, you know, it reminds me of uh, the letter to the Church of Pergamum. This is where Satan has his home on earth. Mm -hmm. Don't expect anything to good to come out of what, uh, what Turkey is doing. Right. And I'm also always reminded that when Erdogan was first elected president, through democratic processes, through the ballot box, mm -hmm. And the ballot box is inimical, uh, the Koran is inimical to the ballot box, mm -hmm. all right, because the ballot box is a uh, human contraption, a human invention, whereas they believe that, you know, they, they are guided by God and they have to do what God wants. So when he was first elected president through democratic processes, an enterprising European journalist uh, was interviewing him and said, well, uh, you know, Mr. President, how do you reconcile the fact that you were elected president through the ballot box, the democratic processes, to your faith in Islam? And his answer was, democracy is like a bus. You ride it until you get to where you want to go. Right. Boy, that's a powerful point. Because Erdogan started out so-called as a, a moderate appearing guy. And like many of these tyrants, they start out as moderate, 
and then they increasingly get more. Um, exactly. I mean, there's no such thing as an extreme Islamist, but more he became he let his true colors as a true Islamist which, shine which, forth. Which, which happened with the young Turks uh, just before the genocides, the Armenian genocide, etc. And they were supposed to be the new hope, the younger men. They were re replacing the Ottoman Empire. They were open-minded. They were going to be like a renaissance in Turkey. And what did they do? The exact opposite. They, they created atrocities that not even the Ottoman Empire and the Sultans mm -hmm. had done. Uh, two million Armenians, uh, at least 700,000 Greeks died wow. at the time. Uh, between 1897 and 1917. Mm -hmm. So they posed exactly what Erdogan is doing. They posed as the new liberals and as the, the uh, people that you could talk to, that you could compromise with, that had a sense of civilization and of respect for human rights, and they were the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that time and again in other countries like Cuba with Castro and Venezuela. Uh, with Chavez and then right. Maduro there now, of just a, a steady decline, and people even end up resorting to, to bizarre things that normally is not in our human nature right. to do. And so uh, it's all so important that we know history, and we just pray for our viewers to have an encounter with the living God and a hunger to know the truth, truth for today with the revelation that the Holy Spirit gives us, but also to understand our history so that we don't make the same mistakes that happened in the past right. that can affect much more than your own family. We need to stand up in bold faith and be courage, courageous people in these days to stand for the truth and righteousness and to be defenders of the faith at any cost. The Bible says, Jesus said that we would go out among wolves, but we need to grow in wisdom and stature into the fullness of Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to give us the revelation to be able to discern the truth, to, to block out the static and the fake news and the anxiety that's in the world, to be able to stay in the place of peace and his rest, to, to be able to discern the times, because many people will be coming to us in the days ahead who are uh, hopeless or uh, downtrodden or beleaguered, and we need to be the light of the world to share Jesus and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ alone. But it doesn't mean that we have to to be led into slaughter, that we would stand for truth and righteousness in a bold way and to stand for justice, that the two pillars of the temple were, were justice and righteousness. Or that we would give up our homes to, and allow ourselves to, 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 to be overrun by these people, yes. uh, and which is what's, what's happening in Greece right now. Yeah, that's so sad because it has such a rich history and as our, our friend from Egypt was sharing this morning about the, the Coptics who were encountering the Holy Spirit, we know uh, Greeks who are encountering the Holy Spirit in many, many countries around the world. And we all have things that we need to unlearn from the traditions of men to re really to come into the full kingdom culture that the Lord created us for. So we just pray for a release of the kingdom of heaven and the culture of the kingdom of heaven in our lives in this day. Thank you so much, Nicholas, for your time. God bless you. Great. And God Thank bless you. all the work that you do, George. I'm Thank a great you. admirer. Thank you, Nicholas. We appreciate your prayers. Thank you.